Good morning. I'm Dr. Kleindl, and today I'm with Dr. Hartshorn and Axel the dog. Tony is a professor here at Montana State University, soils professor, and he's got a lot to say about these sort of things. What's a hydric soil? What's a hydric soil? We chose this particular site because this is a, an upland site. And we know that it's an upland site for a couple of reasons which we're gonna explain in a second. And then we're gonna go off into a wetland. It's a wonderful wetland for, for Bozeman. Characterizing a soil is a super ancient practice. And you can imagine early farmers, you know, 5,000 years ago, were always trying to figure out, well, where am I gonna plant my crops this year? So, I mean, we sort of leverage a little bit of that when we're characterizing soils, even today, 2021. You know, the first thing that we always wanna do when we're trying to characterize the measurable soil properties is just open up an exposure to get to some sense for what a two-dimensional sort of cutaway of the soil would look like. Um, there are a couple different features of this soil that pop out to me very clearly, and one of them is there's a huge color change between the surface of this soil and then the subsurface, and that's most clearly expressed down right here at about eight inches. Um, so darker above, lighter below, and that's perfectly intuitive. I mean, what we know is that anytime you have a green plant, it's actually associated with what are called roots, and those roots are constantly leaking organic matter or sugar, just like donuts, into the soil. And as a consequence, soil organic matter is a soil, it's a soil color bully. We can actually quantify that um, with something called a Munsell color book. All ranges of sort of the visible spectrum, you always wanna be able to find uh, sort of your lifeline page, which is right there called the 10YR page. And I hope that what you can see is this profile sort of looks like this a little bit, right? Darker colors at the top, and that's because of the influence of the organic matter leaking out of roots. It's also a function of leaves decomposing near the surface, and then much brighter colors, so we would call that high chroma and high value values much, much lower. There's a transitional horizon in there between four and eight as I look at the pit, and part of that is that we're losing this beautiful, granular structure, um, which you can always measure by just pulling a sample out and doing popcorn on it, right? And so this is a textbook structure that is consistent with a lot of organic matter. So the organic matter is not only a color bully making the soils darker, but it also provides this beautiful granular structure, which allows, you know, very high infiltration rates if you have a rain event or a snow melt event. Um, and that water is allowed to go then more deeply into the soil. And it sure looks to me, to my eyeball, like we've got an intermediate color between four and eight inches, as well as an intermediate structure. And would you call these, would you name these horizons? Right, so the first horizon is gonna be an A horizon. Um, because the color change is so subtle between the first horizon and the second horizon, I would go in A1, A2, and then I think we're pretty obviously into some kind of B horizon in the subsurface. And the best way to tell what kind of B it is, is to check for how much clay. Excuse me, Axel. Go on, go get it. And the way we can check for how much clay is in the soil is just by hand texturing it. We pull a sample and then we just work up what's called a wad. Um, this is sort of mud pie 101. So if your wad is too wet, you should add some dry soil, which I happen to have right here next to me. And what we're interested in is how long of a ribbon can you make from a moist sample. Um, the reason the length of the ribbon matters and we have three categories that we're interested in. Is the ribbon more than two inches? Is it between one and two inches? Or is it less than an inch? And I hope that you can see that that's more than two inches. The fact that it can create a ribbon more than two inches implies to me that it's some kind of clay. So is it a loam, sandy loam? So this is going clay? to be... What are, we, what are we calling it? Oh, we're gonna eat it now? What's that, what are you doing? Just checking for grit. What? It's got some grit in it, but I'm gonna say that that's a silty loam. I mean, a silty clay at the very bottom. And the way you can tell that is by asking yourself with your eyes closed, 
does smoothness or grittiness predominate? And for me, smoothness predominates, so I would call this texture of the eight to 16 a silty clay. And what would you call the top one? The top one. God, if there was only some kind of triangle that had silt on one side, clay on the other side. You mean like a texture triangle like this? Right, so the big deal is the, this texture triangle looks very complicated, but what we try to encourage our, all of our students to get very competent at is figuring out how long is your ribbon. That gets us three rows. So clays at the top get us the longest ribbons. Intermediate length ribbons here are all called clay loams. And then we have a couple different textures that are associated with very short ribbons or no ribbons at all. Those would be your sandier uh, soils or in some cases a silty soil. Is that, does that help you? Um, and then when I was te testing for grit between my teeth, what I'm actually asking is which column am I in? And if I have a lot of sand, which we read across this x-axis here from low zero to 100% sand, the more gritty I detect, then I'm gonna have sandy clays, sandy clay loams, or sandy loams. So that's just three in this column over here of sandy. And if we have a lot of silt, that silt presents as smoothness. And then so we'll end up with a silty clay, silty clay loam, or a silty loam. So the length of the ribbon gives us clays, clay loams, or loams. And then the columns are modifiers on the front end of it. So let me get you the texture of the top. The top is a... Do you like hot fudge sundaes? Yeah. It's gonna be a silty clay as well. All right. Same textures, top and bottom. I would argue there's a lot more clay in the subsurface. And part of the problem with doing a texture like this in the field is that the more organic matter that you have, the smoother it will feel. In this case, the organic matter is contributing to the length of the ribbon, which I would argue is more than, than two inches. Along that whole face, do you see any indications of a fluctuating water level? I see zero indications of a fluctuating water table in this profile. And what I would look for are what are known as redoxymorphic features. So places where microbes have run out of oxygen and had to downshift metabolically and use what we call alternate electron acceptors because they wanna live just like you wanna live. And when you run out of oxygen, when the water table comes up, in wetland soils, microbes will use alternate electron acceptors. You and I are using what as an electron acceptor? Uh, oxygen. Oxygen, that's why we inhale oxygen. CPR is all about delivering oxygen into a human being, right? Microbes don't need to use oxygen always, especially wetland adapted microbes. They have a whole bunch of metabolic tricks for downshifting their metabolism when oxygen is not readily available. I see no indications of areas of bright red or orange iron colors. So oxidized iron looks like rusted iron, sort of oranger hues, high chroma we would call it. And when the iron is reduced because there are microbes who are not oxygen breathers, they are iron breathers. And when they breathe using ox iron, they will actually turn it into these gray colors. So iron changes color depending on whether it's reduced or oxidized. So these are good examples of what happens to the color of iron once it's reduced metabolically by microbes. It turns more of these blue gray colors. Sweet. As Tony told you, we didn't see any indications of water in the, in the soil pit. But you know what? Let's go look at a wetland. Let's go climb into the bushes and find a wetland. So, all right, Tony, you dug this beautiful hole and you got the water out of it enough to look in. I see the water's pouring in from the sides. Oh my gosh, it's very wet out here. Um, and also, look how clean I am, everybody. And look how dirty Tony is. That's the difference between our professions. I'm a talker. He likes to teach by PowerPoint. <laughs> I like to do hands-on. <laughs> That's so funny. Anyway, but I want to ask you a question about this right here. This looks like a rock. It's a dinosaur covered, egg I pulled out of the bottom. Covered hole. with some amazing reduced soils that are super blue. Oh my Ooh. gosh, that's some incredible stuff. And then this rock that's at the bottom. So this really reduced blue, blue, blue color comes from a long-term saturation enough to for all the oxygen to be gone from the soil. Right? Correct. Let's, let's look at this. This is from our previous hole. 
right here. Correct. Right? So, Oxidized iron, yeah, reduced this, iron. You can really see the difference. This is deep down below, which I assume is muck at the top. This dark stuff looks like dark mud to you, but to me it's organic matter. And you start feeding the microbes donuts, think of this as donuts, underwater, there's no way for them to metabolize those donuts unless they have something other than oxygen. And this color of iron is textbook for iron breathing microbes, iron reducing microbes. And let's talk about this rounded rock that you found at the bottom. Oh my God, they can just see my month so in the old rascal. Um, Waterproof page. <laughs> uh, this rounded rock was down around four feet. Yeah? Yeah. Four or five feet. And this is this is the, the Bozeman fan that we were talking about. That alluvial, it's rounded, which means it's been worked by rivers and such, and it's been deposited all the way around us. And also, when you look at this rock and this rock right next to it, what you see is lots of space. And below us, there's lots of rounded rock like this with lots of holes in it. And those holes get filled with silts and whatnot and mud. But also, this is how water moves through this surface below us. So there's lots of water down below. Hop down there and tell me what you find. All right. What do you want to know? It looks to me like we have a zero to four. I'm going to call this an OI. That's a big O little I, and it stands for fibric material. And that's because as I sit here and I work it, I can still see fibers. And then from four to 12, we end up with slightly brighter material. And I would call this an OE for hemic material. It, it shows more advanced composition and I'm gonna put that little sample right there and I would call that color like a 10 YR 33 and okay. I'm gonna go 12 to 20 on 12 this to 20. gooey layer and then and wait, wait, what do we call the gooey layer we're gonna call the gooey layer an OA so you're telling me it goes from fibric to hemorrhic to, to sapric fibric by to OI hemic OE to sapric. OA correct you souls guys got names for everything you know we're just like you plant guys and you water guys uh, and then listen to this I'm gonna give you a little audio tour of the pit. That's my shovel hitting roots and organic matter. I'm at 12 inches, roots and organic matter. And then all of a sudden you get down to 20. Listen for it. It's gonna sing. Hello. What's that? That sounds like rock. That's our dinosaur egg made layer of Bozeman fan. We pick up these gravels, cobbles, stones, and boulders. Would you call that a sea layer? I would no. call it a sea layer. Sea, because it's parent material. That's what sea stands for. What hydric indicators do you see down there? So, that would make this a hydric soil. That's hard. But the first one has to be that these soils are saturated. An excellent example of that that I can demonstrate is here is a perfectly good clod of soil. This is four to 12 inches, and when I squeeze it, that water runs right down to my elbow. So these awkward, soils are saturated. Awkward moisture regime. Number two, I almost passed out bailing this hole because I could smell hydrogen sulfide, which is, of course, what we associate with rotten eggs or yeah. fart. Your nose evolved to tell you when things are funkifying. I can smell a little bit of it, but I think my nose has completely saturated. So if I fall in head first, just pull me out. These microbes are provided with plenty of sugar right. and not enough oxygen. So they switch and they become sulfate breathers. Mm -hmm. And when you're a sulfate breather, you produce hydrogen sulfide, which is rotten egg odor. And would you call this the histosol? You know histos is Greek for tissue. Tissue. So this is essentially rotting tissue. Yes. Plant tissue, root tissue, human tissue. How many oh, bodies are buried at here? At least one. Well, I'm on my way. <laughs> and so that's a hard question because you have to meet certain depth criteria and certain carbon criteria to meet the definition of a histosol. Those are the rules. 
And you, can you tell that in the field? I can't tell it in the field because I don't know the organic carbon. We can't see organic carbon. But a good rule of thumb, I'm going to vote that this is... God, Jesus Christ. <laughs> I'm going to vote this is 70% organic matter, which means 35% organic carbon. Because uh, organic matter is double. As a rule of thumb, <clears throat> organic carbon. So yeah, I would go histosol here. Also, I got one more question. What does it taste like? Because I'm not going to eat, I'm not going to eat it. Maybe I'm missing out. Is it sugary? Is it is it septic-y? Is it like the septic stuff we've been talking about in other videos? The septic, it's just the septic stream of us? Yeah. Which is leaking <laughs> my direction? Yes. Fecal coal I'm forms. sure we can beep that. Um, sure, yeah, go ahead. What does it taste like? Jeez. Um, yeah, Zooks. You know what? It tastes like um, fiber material, and it's not sweet. But the key is, when you put a little bit of this between your teeth, you can tell if it has sand grains in it. You can tell if it has silt grains in it, because your teeth can detect sand down to 10 microns. So, so And I've got no grit. Okay. No grit. So it's not really a taste thing, it's a, it's a texture thing. Right. Yeah. Okay. It's not like umami. Well, you got more grit than I do because I'm not putting it in my mouth. Why not? <laughs> if wetlands are doing their job, they should be cleaning up all those fecal coliforms. Which is an ecosystem service. Exactly. Boom. Thank you. Yeah. What? I trust the wetland to do its job. You don't. That's interesting. Well, you can, you can just stay in there all day. I mean, you look like you're in hog heaven, literally. I am in hog heaven.